All right, can everyone hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Wonderful, good. wonderful. Well, it's, it's an honor to be here to um, discuss one of the things that I deal with not too frequently in the operating room, which is a derotomy. Um, and so can the camera point down here? So we have this very nice exposure, uh, and we can see here at the completion of the decompression, we have a derotomy. And so the first step when identifying a derotomy like this is to find someone else to blame, even if you're fully responsible. Once you get that out of the way, it's very important to stay calm. And uh, as you can see in this derotomy, there are nerve roots of the cauda equina that are right under here. And so to avoid having the suction uh, drag up those nerve roots, I like to take a cottonoid and protect those nerve roots so that I can continue to expand and make sure I have the margin of the entirety of the derotomy. The second thing is uh, consideration for how we are going to repair this. And so the repair can either be primary, and in this case, with a linear derotomy like this, we can certainly repair this primarily with a suture line. And we'll discuss some of the strategies later on today of, of how we would go about doing that. For the purposes of this lab, we are going to be repairing this uh, derotomy with a patch graft. And there's many different types of patch grafts that one can use, including um, uh, cadaveric skin or bovine pericardium. And what we've done here is uh, we have a uh, dural substitute graft. Uh, first, we use a ruler to measure out the dimensions of this derotomy so we can cut an appropriately sized patch of dura. You can see this cut out of here. We have soaked that dural patch in saline so that we can now start repairing this like this. What I like to do to repair uh, and suture in this graft is I like to first, if we can focus on that. Put a suture, and here we have an ethabond suture with um, a uh, foro ethabond suture on an RB1 needle. I put a suture through the apex. And then, Garrett, let's get a, a snap to put on that. Mm -hmm. So, Ganesh, can you talk uh, whilst you're doing this? Can, can we ask you a question? Yeah, please, go ahead. So what's the ideal suture material? Is it 4-O-Neuralon? Is it 6-O-Proline? You know, I've gone both ways. I started with 4-O-Neuralons, uh, and currently I use either 5-O or 6-O-Proline. I do find that the monofilament with a small needle uh, tends to be more gentle on the native dura. Let's put a snap on, mm -hmm. on that. Just to hold it in place. I want to make an advertisement. You gave an amazing and uh, uh, in the thousands hit rate um, talk on uh, dural pathologies, and it did open my eyes. So we really appreciate your expertise. Oh, no, it's uh, totally my pleasure, and thank you for having me back. And we need to focus in a little bit more. We can't see the drill patch while it's kind of out of focus right now. Yeah, good. Perfect. So what we've done is we've placed those sutures through the apex, and now we will suture those. And just to secure it in place, you can see that there is a, we hold the suture with a snap to the drape. Here, yep. Mm -hmm. So we lower the dural patch over the derotomy and we'll begin securing the graft to the native dura. Watch and your again, head. with Can you the put your head back, head back, Ganesh, bring your head back. Sorry, oh, sorry, this is hard. Okay, can you see there? Yes, now we can see. Perfect, it. perfect. Appreciate and so it. So when we suture, we suture from the graft to the host to make sure that we get the graft to parachute underneath the native dura. And what I'll do here now is I will tie. And Garrett, if you can hold that dural patch down with a mm -hmm. pickup, you yep. can uh, use this pickup right here in my mm -hmm. hand. Yep. Do you use any specific uh, pickups to not injure the dura more? Are there like uh, favorite 
uh, blunt, like jeweler pickups, Jarrett's? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, there are uh, we could uh, in the OR we would use um, Castro pickups, which are very fine tip pickups and allow us to have uh, good control over over the dura. Yeah. Um, I love them. And if there is concern for uh, the dura, the native dura not being, uh, not having very good integrity. We will um, make sure that when we're suturing, we have appropriate coverage uh, of the stitch to dura that isn't as ragged. Um, and then this one right here. Hey, Ganesh. Yes, sir. Um, JJ, just just a, a question. So you get that dural tear, not that you get any, but then the first thing that comes out is pretty much the entire cauda aquinas comes through that hole. So could you just, while you're doing this, speak about what you do, uh, what you tell the anesthesiologist whose fault it was to get the dural tear, what they can do, or how you get those nerves back in, and what, what's, what's your protocol? Uh, uh, just to make sure I heard the question, what do I tell, uh, what are the moves uh, with yeah, the rest so of the team members, the anesthesiologists? Right, uh, and then now you've got a pack of nerves that are sticking through that hole. How do so you get them back in? Your head, what do you do to prevent ahead. them from coming back out so you could do what you're doing now? Yeah, no, thank you for that, uh, that question. That's exactly right. So uh, fixing durotomies is, is much like dealing with a uh, ruptured aneurysm. You need to make sure that the team knows that something has happened that's unintended and it's going to take uh, a bit of teamwork from everyone. Go ahead and relax there. Uh, and so the first thing I'll have the anesthesia team do is I'll have the, them place the patient's head in uh, reverse, uh, sorry, in, in Trendelenburg to reduce the pressure of the, of the fecal sac. The second thing uh, that can happen is that there can be a lot of pressure on the uh, uh, on the nerve roots, trying to, yeah, let's go ahead and put that there, uh, trying to escape through the dural opening. And so it can be challenging to get those nerve roots to go back in uh, through the dural opening. And uh, what I do in those cases sometimes is if the dural opening is very small, but there's, uh, as sometimes we see, like a spaghetti of nerve roots coming out through, through the dural opening, and it's very hard to get it back either with a nerve hook or a Penfield 4. Uh, is that I will actually make the dural opening just a little bit bigger to have the ability to put those nerves back in. Okay, so here we have um, the, the dural graft is secured to the apices of the durotomy. And now we are going to begin suturing the graft. And keep your head back. I know it's hard. Sorry, we intentionally got rid of the microscope um, to have the overhead camera because we saw the picture quality was better. But okay, so got it. working, looking good. In the interest of time, I'm just going to advance these a little bit more than I normally would. Normally, I would space these sutures around every two to three millimeters. And the key again is to make sure that the bites of the graft and the bites to the native dura are narrow enough that we're not creating too much of uh, Question, what, how do you, um, while you're filling that up, do you start thinking how long you're going to keep this patient down after surgery? And you, when do you use the subarachnoid drain um, in addition to keeping them uh, down for a little longer? Yeah, and we'll, we'll cover this in, in the talk that I'll have later on. Is uh, There's more recent data that suggests that early mobilization uh, actually works out better in terms of post-operative complications um, and that uh, definitely not keeping people head of bed down or flat for longer than 24 hours re uh, reduces the risk of having complications related to uh, being immobilized for a prolonged period of time. And also it did not increase the risk in that study that we'll, we'll cover, did not increase the risk of a uh, needing a revision. Ganesh, this is John, John Dymar. Say, um, actually the CNS guidelines, we reviewed that and you're 100% right. 
the literature seems that bed rest doesn't make a lot of difference unless you have like a massive tear in a subarachnoid drain or something that you can get them up right away. It doesn't make any difference. You would normally wouldn't use a graft on this. You would just repair the dura primarily. You're just doing this for. Oh uh, yeah. So for this yeah. one, I would not use a, a graft. Which um, this one, I would normally just use a. Uh, go ahead and hold this one over. And, and I would just uh, repair this one primarily. Yeah, and and we all like nice midline tears here, but we have problems with lateral tears and tears down around the nerve root. That um, how do you do? You have any tips on how to fix those? Because uh, other than gloom. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. I actually find that the more problematic, let's get scissors here. The more problematic durotomies are the ones that are in the midline. As we get further out lateral, there may actually be enough structures along the lateral aspect of the, and do you want to suture going back the other way? Tamping on it. Uh, that can help buttress any other repair strategies that we may use, such as fat graft, tissue, fibrin glue, surgery cell, that it may actually provide enough back pressure to the, uh, to the repair. Um, but the, the key even in those cases is to make sure that we have um, an understanding of the margin of the dural tear. So um, and so it may require resection of additional facet uh, to, to get out there. Sure. Yeah. So Ganesh, another, another question is JJ again. Um, how about your colleagues that recommend, especially on the bigger holes? Uh, Is it possible to raise the nothing. volume? Oh, Let them rest uh, for 12 hours and then get them up the next day and the just volume. put a Duragen patch on it. And they um, kind of say it's, it, it's all okay. They pay no never mind to it and they seem to get away with it. And glue. And glue. Yeah. But I'm a little nervous about putting glue on an open Dura. JJ, is that you? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah sorry, uh, yeah. I, I couldn't hear the entire question. What was so, the... so what do you think about leaving um, a hole open and just putting a Durgen patch on it with some glue? Uh, you know, um, I think it all depends on what the configuration of the, the dural breach is. That's a good bite. Um, and um, I think if it's a, if it's a breach where uh, there's CSF with a Valsalva maneuver that the anesthesiologist may provide, and I place the Duragen. I would be concerned that the Duragen may not sufficiently um, in, uh, scar down and, to create that watertight leak, uh, watertight closure. And um, it's a, oh, sorry, it's this John. It's a whole different ballgame in MIS in these <laughs> as far as patching them than open. Also, I mean. They have so much tissue that you can tamponade it with and seal it off with. But the, pro the problem is there's just no good, when we look through this stuff, there's, it's impossible to do a randomized prospective study to see whether repair or patching or glue or a combination of them really make a difference uh, and what has the best results because it's an inadvertent uh, kind of problem that you can't create. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, the, the basic tenets of, uh, getting a dural closure are really doing your best intraoperatively to get some form of primary closure, um, buttressing the repair with some kind of, uh, I like to do some kind of onlay like surgery cell, um, uh, maybe laying down some patient fat graft or, um, or even muscle. And then, um, and then after the procedure is to uh, mobilize the patient as tolerated. Um, with uh, ensuring that the, when they when they get symptomatic by getting uh, either postural headaches or there's a leak of fluid that it's addressed um, e efficiently and that we don't just put our uh, head in the ground and pretend like it doesn't exist. Um, they can be very challenging on the reoperation to come up with strategies to close a durotomy um, on the second procedure. Uh, Uh, so we're getting by Dr. Farakbash. Uh, these are excellent interactions from our faculty. So I thank them for all their questions. Dr. Farakbash uh, is addressing something very common. That is, uh, we've done a complex surgery, and there's a little um, 
It's called a, a bleb frequently, a little arachnoid uh, exuberation. Even on testing with uh, pressurization on Valsalva, 40 millimeters mercury, there's no CSF extravasation. That's good turgor in the drill tube. Do we repair those preemptively? Uh, if so, when? Or can we just kind of leave those and reinforce the dura? Yeah, I actually do repair those, even if it's just a dural bleb. Um, because I worry that with the dural bleb, uh, there's a, um, a risk of that arachnoid billowing out through the dural defect and becoming a pseudomeningocele in and of itself, even if it's contained within the arachnoid. Um, and then uh, the, the possibility of having some kind of bone pathology that could uh, poke into that arachnoid uh, can be an issue as well. Uh, so with a with an arachnoid bleb, I uh, tend to, I tend to, um, I tend to take care of those and suture those primarily, or with some kind of graft onlay. And unfortunately, when I do that, I see that CSF starts to leak out. But I do feel that um, once we have it closed, I do feel better uh, that there's a reduced risk of a pseudomeningocele down the road. Um, so this is the dural patch closure, and at this point, we would ask for the anesthesia team to provide a Valsalva maneuver to 30, 40, usually around 30 is where I ask them to stop. And we would keep an eye on whether there is any CSF leaking out through this. If there is any suture holes or gaps where there's CSF leaking out, then what I would do is harvest some fat and uh, close up those, uh, those uh, gaps. Like for example, here, if there's some CSF leaking out, I would buttress that with a little bit of a fat onlay and a figure of eight um, to, to secure that leak. Um, and it's really key, we, we pay attention obviously to when the patient is having the peak uh, of the Valsalva maneuver, but I also uh, really watch for that release phase, and we'll talk about that later, where there's a little bit of a fluid wave and um, the CSF may actually uh, leak out during the release phase, so it's important to watch through the entirety of the cycle of the Valsalva. And the, the second thing is just an appreciation that even if the intraoperatively we don't see leakage of CSF, it's not uncommon after the dural tube and the intrathecal space fills up that actually there is a possibility of CSF that could leak out through these holes. Um, and uh, that's when the patient may actually declare an ongoing pseudomeningocele or a CSF leak postoperatively. So even if we feel great about the closure of the CSF intraoperatively, it's possible that once the fecal sac fills up, it will actually declare itself. Simple technical question. I saw that you, I know you did more coarse sutures than what you would do usually, but uh, locking versus non-locking sutures. I was always taught to do locking sutures. Is that just uh, not necessary or do we necrose the dura when I do a locking suture actually? Yeah, you know, I, I, you can go either way. I think with these types of very close sutures, uh, when I've done locking sutures, I find that the geometry of how the sutures start to connect um, may actually pull the, the graft in a certain way where there's a little bit of a dog ear, or, um, something that keeps a little hole intact. And so I tend to just do a, a baseball running stitch, simple running stitch. And uh, as you pointed out, the, the suture lines would be, I probably would have put about twice as many sutures along both of those limbs. But this just highlights the point within the time constraints of exactly the kind of technique that we would normally use. And so and then, manufacturers now addressing what John said in MIS and tubular surgeries, there yeah. seem to be more uh, dural tears and they seem to have less consequences because we have a muscle uh, jacket around it that's more forgiving. But several manufacturers now offer a variety of clips and suture and staple techniques. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Have you looked yeah, at this? I, I, yeah. I, so I just wanted to just uh, comment on the, the concept of MIS related leaks and the leaks with those very hard to reach uh, uh, lateral durotomies along the shoulder of the nerve root or the axilla of the nerve root, similar concept that there's just a lot more um, architecture that can provide back pressure. Um, so that's why I don't worry as much about those lateral durotomies. With respect to clip techniques, I, I think they're all reasonable options for an appropriate uh, durotomy. One other uh, clipping technique, um, if you don't have access to uh, any of those uh, specialized uh, clips that are provided by various vendors is um, the use of aneurysm clips can also be useful. So uh, a durotomy like this, you can tent up the dura and put a couple of aneurysm clips along the, the limb of the durotomy as well. Those are very inexpensive, right? Uh, not necessarily totally inexpensive, but uh, they, uh, uh, it's less expensive than taking the patient back for an 
No doubt, all yeah. relative, isn't it? You've done a first. Uh, we've never had a dural repair uh, session, and this actually came across quite nicely. So thank you for your expertise and uh, showing us something like this. Thank you, and thank you to Garrett. Thank you. So we revisit uh, the subject of metabolic bone.